right, I'm going to stop sharing and we will get started. So everyone, welcome. Greatly appreciate everyone who was able to join us today. And thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we're going to go through our lightning talks. Each session is going to be about 10 minutes. And as a message for our speakers, I will give you guys a two minute warning. You will notice that when I do a little clock, whenever I do this, just to help us try to stay on track. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and start with our first speaker. So her name is Verena. I'm going to say Heist. Did I pronounce that correctly? Fantastic. Yeah, just about. That's good. <laughs> okay. I tried. I tried. She's from Freelance Open Science Researcher in Germany, and her presentation is going to be Road to Openness, a web-based open science self-assessment tool for research performing organizations. So with that, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, that sounds like quite a handful, actually. <laughs> uh, but I hope it makes sense. Yeah, so my name is Verena. I'm a biomedical researcher by training, actually. And nowadays I work as a freelance open science uh, researcher, trainer and consultant. So uh, I'm available for hire if anyone wants me. Um, this is just my disclosure form to uh, give you an idea of uh, who I work with and uh, to tell you that I am a lobbyist for open science, but I don't have a hidden agenda. Uh, so I work mainly with, um, uh, with uh, not-for-profit organizations. Um, obviously, a road to openness was developed by a team of people, not just by me. Uh, so thanks to, to the sort of uh, experts who developed this uh, together with me. So there's uh, the five of us plus uh, Marta and Johanna who um, who were um, working for the funder uh, at the time and who helped a lot uh, with organizational stuff. So uh, why road to openness? Before I get into the meat of what it is about, uh, let's have a look at why we decided to develop it in the first place. Um, so we had a, a funder in Germany that got us basically together with a question uh, how we can um, open practices um, uh, at an institutional level. So it was really aimed at uh, universities uh, to strengthen the societal impact um, of science. And so uh, most of us uh, experts came really from uh, bottom-up movements in, um, in universities. And we said really what we need is um, uh, help from the top down. So we really need to find a way to get institutional leadership involved uh, in um, uh, in sort of developing open science practices uh, at that level. And so we thought in, in order to support them, um, we need to ask or answer four basic questions. So what is open science in the first place? I think this is a big question for institutional leadership. Uh, why should they care about open science? Um, who should be involved in the implementation uh, at institutional level and um, how to implement open science practices in the first place? So these are really the starting points for um, developing Road to Openness. Uh, and what it is, is uh, relatively uh, easily explained. So it's basically a big questionnaire uh, with two different stages. So um, the first stage is uh, really to give you information about different open science practices. I will have a look at what these are in a second. Uh, and then it's a big questionnaire um, to uh, sort of self-assess what open science practices um, uh, look like at the institution, what kind of training is available, um, and what kind of uh, infrastructure support. And then I think the, the maybe more interesting part is the second stage, where we then offer recommendations based on the uh, on the answers in the questionnaire so that uh, institutions can really plan their, their development strategically. Um, the one thing that was really important to us as experts was that we uh, this tool is in the end freely available uh, online for anyone to use, and you can use it anonymously. So you don't need to enter any identifying data um, because uh, we realized that some uh, institutions wouldn't necessarily be uh, happy with that. I think it's also important to say what it is not. It's uh, not developed for external audit purposes. Uh, it can't be used for objective comparison. It's not a ranking. I personally hate rankings, but we don't need to get into this. Um, and we are also not interested in the entered data. So the data are automatically deleted after 90 days, uh, and you don't need to worry about that. Um, the only thing you need to worry about is if you enter data and then you want to continue the questionnaire, remember that it's going to be deleted after 90 days. So we look at um, a really a com comprehensive um, list of different open science practices. So we look at um, open access research outputs, which is obviously about publications, data, and materials and methods. Uh, I think the important part here is that we look at both digital and physical um, outputs, uh, which is not necessarily part of uh, everyone's sort of open science idea. We look at citizen science, we look at open innovation, at open education resources, uh, and research quality management, that area I would normally call reproducibility, but that's a term that not everyone is familiar with, so we uh, decided to call it research quality management. We also look at open governance, so in how far um, you have sort of transparent processes of governance in the institution, 
and open research assessment, which is really about incentivizing um, open science practices. So you can have a look uh, at what it looks like on road to openness.de. Uh, so um, uh, there, there's one caveat though, uh, we have, uh, well, we started the de development um, in German uh, and the tool is completely and fully functional in uh, German. The English translation is still underway. So I think we're about three quarters there. Um, you can see that for research quality management, open governance and open research assessment, it says incomplete. So these are the parts that haven't been uh, translated yet. Um, but most of the um, most of the other stuff has been translated. And so what does it look like? So you first get an information uh, sheet uh, on the different areas. So when you click on citizen science, you see this. You see first a definition um, of uh, what we think citizen science means, then the potential, and that's potential for the institution, why they should be interested in citizen science. Uh, and in this case, we also have sort of an important distinction that it's bidirectional and it's not just about talking to the public. And then, like I said, it's a big questionnaire. So uh, you start to give information on open science projects and uh, the, the way the questionnaire works is you have a sentence basically that you need to complete. So for example, participation of citizens in research projects is not a priority, is of interest, but not a priority, is prioritized, or uh, simply, I don't know. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big questionnaire. We look at open access research outputs, um, and we tend to look at, uh, at these different sort of sub areas, practices, training, infrastructure, and funding. And that's pretty much the same for all the different areas. Sorry, I'm just gonna go through them very quickly because um, I don't have that much time. Um, in terms of open research assessment, we look at incentivizing open science practices within the institution, but also uh, whether um, the institution follows what I would term good practice in research assessment. And then um, in the end, once you fill in the questionnaire, uh, you get this kind of output. So you get like a, we have like a rating scale, you get between one and three stars, uh, depending on, on how far developed your institution is. And this is what it might look like. So you might just get one star for projects, two for training and infrastructure, um, you get three. Uh, but then uh, if you haven't entered any information on funding, you get a question mark there. And I think the, the really interesting part um, uh, is, uh, is um, and this is where a lot of uh, time and effort went into, is the recommendations. Um, so I've, uh, I've, uh, what I'm showing you here is, um, uh, is the sort of open science strategy uh, recommendations. So first of all, you get like a general recommendations bit. This is based on how many stars you have. So this will be the same for every institution, depending on uh, sort of the star level. Uh, but then you also get customized recommendations. And these are really based on um, depending uh, how you answered previous questions, uh, you will receive recommendations for what to do or what not to do. Um, and I think the the really, uh, this is where the meat is of, of Road to Openness. Um, so it's like a, a huge list of things that you can do or potentially do. Um, uh, just uh, as an example here for developing an open science strategy, we have lots of different uh, links here. We have lots of different examples that we came up with or that we could find on the internet. So there's like a, a huge um, sort of search that went into this to, to develop the um, recommendations that we have find here. I think you might uh, like to ask whether or not it works. Um, so we started this project in uh, 2021 actually, um, and uh, we developed this tool together with three different universities in Germany. So we had one university of applied sciences, one university that was focused more on engineering and one really comprehensive institution. We co-developed this with them to see um, uh, if it works for them, uh, but also like what, what makes sense um, uh, to them as not necessarily open science experts, you know, does our phrasing make sense and so on. We officially t launched the tool um, two years ago um, and we haven't really done very much on it since, partly because we don't have any funding anymore. Uh, so if anyone uh, wants to give us more funding to develop this further, please let me know. Um, what have we learned so far um, in terms of university leadership? I think um, uh, their understanding of open science uh, seems to be limited to mostly open access publishing plus maybe open data or research data management. Um, there is a huge interest from university leadership, but the, the, sc the scale of the challenge is often unclear. Um, and there are distributed responsibilities within institutions for different open science themes. So it really takes a village to find out more about what's happening in the institution. Uh, at least that's true for, for large universities. Um, and interestingly enough, we have an open science community um, at all of the different universities. It's just that often uh, leadership doesn't even know about them. Unfortunately, there seems to be very little networking within the open science themes or, or across them. Um, and uh, I think one of the problems that we've uh, talked about uh, also in this conference quite a lot is that the culture of openness is really difficult to create in the current academic system. I think this is something I don't need to expand on here with the audience. 
Um, and really, Road to Openness is about starting the conversation. It's about the question, uh, you know, what is open science? Um, it's uh, starting the conversation between leadership and the experts uh, in the institution. Um, it's also about the, the question how different areas such as re research support uh, connect with um, bottom-up movements if they exist. Uh, a lot of the institutions that we talk to do have bottom-up movements as well, where particular early career researchers are interested in making um, things happen. Um, and implementing open science is uh, obviously both about institutional development, but it's also about changing people's minds. So it's really not um, uh, uh, simply a top-down process. It can't be understood as a top-down process. Um, really, we need to think about this much more in terms of change management and, and how we approach this from a change management perspective. And I think the other thing that we also noticed, um, and I think that's that's quite obvious, I guess, is that every institution is different. Um, everyone has their own sets of strength, weaknesses and priorities. And so they require their own sets of recommendations, especially when it comes to, you know, different priorities. Uh, I think there's uh, lots of difference in terms of size, for example, in terms of financial resources and so on. So uh, institutions really uh, differ massively, obviously. Uh, in terms of future outlook, so um, the next version will have a complete English translation, hopefully in a couple of weeks time. Uh, and we really need to update the recommendations and links um, because uh, some of them have been uh, removed, obviously, now from the Internet. So we really need to make sure that we have um, those updated. Uh, and there are lots of ideas that we have for Road to Openness. So one of the things that we'd love to do is offer consultancy and training services alongside the self-assessment. Uh, we'd like to provide open science case studies uh, for people to, to look at. Um, we'd love to create a community of Road to Openness users uh, to be able to share experiences uh, and maybe potentially also develop this into an uh, audit service, something like an open science award. Um, but that's uh, obviously um, uh, further down the line. And I think the the aim and what I want to stress here is that we re really want to provide a not-for-profit service for research performing organizations. For us, it's, it's not about making money. Um, it's really about providing a service that can be of use uh, to institutions, which is also um, uh, why, and sorry, I'm, I'm bringing this up again, um, we are we are looking for for funders to help us with this. Um, and uh, obviously, if you're interested, you can sign up for our newsletter to to hear when the translation is finally out. Um, or you can also email us. We'd love to help you and your institution. Um, but obviously, we'd also love to hear from you if you have ideas for future developments, uh, ideas for collaborations, and so on. So yes, I think that's all I wanted to say. I hope that's within the ten minutes uh, and that I was allotted. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Our next presenter is Paula from Open Air, um, C-N-R-I-S-T-I. And his presentation is the Open Air Graph, a comprehensive knowledge graph for open science scholarly communication. So, Paulo, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Yes, I'm trying to share my screen. Hold on a second. Uh, Okay, basic advanced, where is the PowerPoint? I can't see the PowerPoint. A second, let me try that again. Zoom, share, here it is. I think I found it. Okay. Let me start from the start. Okay. Can you hear me? Fine? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm presenting today is the open air graph is one of the uh, uh, scientific knowledge graphs made available today. Uh, so just to introduce you to the concept, if you're not really aware of what a scientific knowledge graph is, but it's basically uh, a metadata collection that is uh, built by aggregating data sources from scholarly communication, trusted tr data sources from the scholarly communication domain. So these can be repositories, can be publisher website, uh, and in the case of the open air graph, this extends also to data repositories, software repositories, and so on. So the whole idea is to bring together uh, an amount of information, uh, possibly made it uh, open, open data, that can be used for many for many uh, final uh, end user applications, such as discovery or monitoring or research assessment and so on. So the whole idea is to make this graph that we are building public. So it's a public good funded by uh, the European Commission um, and part of the EOSC, uh, so the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, so just to give you an idea what we're talking about, the graph is made up of these entities. So we have the research products in the middle uh, that can be publications. Uh, so things that you read, digital objects that you read, like papers, thesis books, etc. Research data, so data sets of many kinds from different disciplines. So we aggregate sources 
from uh, a quite large amount uh, of different domains uh, in Europe, research infrastructures and uh, clusters. Software, so this includes also software repositories in the research domain and other products, uh, which do not actually fit exactly on those uh, three classes, could be disciplinary specific products like proteins or uh, sequences, DNA sequences, crystals, or whatever. Now, products are, of course, linked to prop persons, so to people uh, through the ORCID identifier. They come from data sources, so they're strictly connected to the, 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 the say, the, the, the services on, uh, on the internet from which we collect this information and where the files of the products are potentially stored. They can also be linked to projects, and projects, of course, are in turn linked to streams and funders. So we're collecting straight from uh, many funder databases, uh, we count up to 30 worldwide from US, Australia, uh, Asia, and Europe, uh, of course, including the European Commission. And we're trying to link uh, at the project level where possible uh, to the products that have been funded by such projects. And of course, we have organizations. So that includes a large and vast number of registries of organizations, including ROAR, but many others from the uh, countries that we uh, are dealing with, offering us, for example, the funder data, and in some cases, also the organizations. Now, to remember, uh, there's a diversity of projects, so the products, so we are not focusing only on peer-reviewed publication, but with publications, but we're also extending our range to other kinds of objects, of course, from the preprints, but um, including institutional repositories, we strongly believe that institutional repositories uh, as pushed then uh, by the green open access wave, of course, are important to preserve uh, information. So we are collecting also from those. And of course, to resource data and software because we uh, foster uh, the idea of reproducibility and of course of uh, monitoring and research assessment that extends to different kinds of profiles of the researcher, which may be more of a technical contribution, a data manufacturing and so on. We embed indicators where these are available from the usage counts, uh, so downloads and views of the objects um, that we collect from the many data sources uh, that are connected to our graph, to the usual uh, citation counts, of course, because these are very common, but also we are collecting from libraries the APC, so the article processing charges at the level of the persistent identifier and the DOIs. So we are trying to provide through the graph a common view over the whole research outcome. We rely on persistent identifiers, but also include, of course, as I just mentioned, objects that do not have persistent identifiers as mm, researchers typically use their national or institutional repositories to store the data. And not necessarily all the data sources that are trusted by the community, in fact, rely on uh, uh, persistent identifier agencies. Uh, the whole graph is built uh, producing stable graph identifiers that, of course, can be very useful for the end user applications, the, so the end stream applications. So we basically track in science. So uh, when any events happens, the publication of an object or a product, as we call it, the citation of an object uh, for any reason. So different kinds of semantics is not just citations, it's supplemented by, part of, etc. Uh, we include events such as this is a new project, these are the objects connected to this new project, and the reasons are monitoring uh, of open science, as you've been present in the previous sessions in this uh, very interesting conference, uh, these uh, points were really touched upon, they're quite deep, and discovery of science. How do we do that? Uh, so quickly, because that takes a long time, it's... Um, uh, a quite complex infrastructure. The one we're building is a big data one. So we are collecting from data sources, which are validated. Uh, in many of these data sources are compliant to the guidelines that we provide. Uh, the guidelines are, let's say, uh, instructions on how to expose metadata. And these are crucial to us. Many platforms, repository platforms, have embedded them into their implementation. So if you pick up a DSpace or a Dataverse or e an ePrints, you will find them already as part of your system. So you already uh, let's say compliant to uh, the open air graph guidelines and to the European guidelines, of course. And many other sources instead are instrumental. So the ones that we believe should be in anyway, they may not be compliant, but they're key and important, like Crossref, Datasite, uh, Open Citations, uh, many others. I'm not going to mention them all, them all. We aggregate this data, we enrich it by mining. So we are where possible downloading, thanks to uh, agreements with the publishers, but also thanks to crawling infrastructure PDFs, when these are open access, of course. 
We are up to the 30 millions today, and we perform mining to potentially find links that are missing. A typical example is this paper has been published by, uh, has been, sorry, funded by this uh, project of this funder specifically. So we inspect the paper, we find all possible links, we find also subjects, as you can see, fields of science, and we have a, an extensive analysis for sustainable development goals. And then after that, we perform the duplication. So we bring the objects together. When we collect metadata about the same objects from different sources, of course, there's a natural problem of merging them. Uh, the policy that we have is that the preprint and the postprint and the published version uh, is in fact the same scientific effort. So we're counting this one in terms of monitoring and research assessment. So the very same copy of the same object across different data sources is not counted by multiple times. And uh, of course, we bring together all the citations to these objects if these are different. This typical example is archive and published version with a DOI or PubMed and published version with DOI. So we bring together the citations that uh, gives, um, let's say, a clear view of uh, inspection of the data. Then we enrich them by inference. I'm not going to expose what we're going to do there, but propagation of data from one object to another thanks to relationships and so on. This is typical of ORCID identifiers that can migrate from a publication object to a data object when they share a supplemented by, when they share common authors, etc. So there are conditions that we exploit and the topology of the graph to, let's say, propagate information uh, from one node to others in its neighbor. And then we publish it uh, open in the open uh, with, through an index. So that requires a uh, complex infrastructure and a lot of people working around it with different skills. So uh, we publish uh, on a monthly updates the data that is available through APIs. Uh, we have a lot of people working on cleaning, the duplication, enrichment, establishing agreements with publishers, for example, so also the policy level. Uh, we have people, experts in full text mining, because that's necessary and uh, AI uh, in order to uh, uh, project the graph into models that can return uh, information that is not available today. And we run all this uh, on a, a quite powerful infrastructure, counting uh, more than one petabyte of data and terabytes of uh, RAM. Uh, oops. Uh, now, these are the data sources that we are collecting from. Um, something like 2,000 and more, uh, indirectly 70,000, because we collect from aggregators which hide sources behind. This is to give you an idea. Anyway, we have, we range from the usual suspects, so Crossref, UK PubMed, Archive, and so on, to uh, data sources that are very typical of research infrastructures, like uh, uh, data scientific databases, or aggregators and portals from uh, uh, the communities that we are dealing with uh, every day. As open air, we work with many communities on different research infrastructures levels. Um, you may have uh, questions on this part, but I'm not going to go through it. So these are numbers, just to give you an idea. These are after the duplication. So we count uh, close to 200 million publications. As you can see, 400 a thousand software, software publishing is still growing and growing a lot. So if you look at a graph of growth is uh, incredibly peak, uh, picking up, but uh, at the same time is not really a, a practice, a practice, a common practice. So most of the research software we find are still in GitHub repositories. We need to mine, reach out from the paper to the software, create metadata, create notes uh, of metadata. And this is not uh, an obvious thing to do. We are connected to software heritage. So there's a lot of collaboration, trying to identify the subset of software heritage that is effectively produce production of research. So as you can see there, these are numbers. So you have all the time to take a look at them. Um, of course, we care about citations. So we uh, collect the whole cross and Kochi and all possible registries out there uh, of citations and we produce ours. So we contribute to those. We produce more than 10 um, million publications from our uh, inference. Um, consumers, we have many consumers, a range, of course, the commissions, so the funders, we have many funders that are using our data for the purpose of open science processing. We have uh, organizations or ministries like the National Open Access Monitor in Ireland, the World Bank, and we have researchers, of course, that are using our data to produce their science in science of science and bibliometrics. 
And we have uh, the publisher themselves, including Elsevier, who's using our uh, links between publications and data, uh, the EOSC or Springer, with which we have a very good relationship. So they're offering their uh, PDFs uh, in order to infer links to data and so on. So there's a constructive uh, flow of information there. You can access the graph through data sets in Zenodo, which are published uh, every six months. Uh, we have the whole graph plus slices of the graph, depending on what you need. And of course, you can always access them uh, for free uh, through the APIs. We have uh, a number of APIs that you can uh, reach uh, out through this uh, link here. So api.openair.eu. Um, we have, an, um, I think, a quite clear documentation, Rich, where we describe more in detail the steps that I mentioned before, where you can find all the information to access the API and exploit the data. You can find the uh, uh, a play, uh, let's say a sandbox, uh, so a subset of the graph with instructions on how to reuse it through Zeppelin and other notebooks. And uh, if you want to know more, there's also a forum that we have very recently launched where you can ask questions and, of course, find the answers uh, if you can provide one. So that was my last slide. Um, of course, we see collaboration. So if you have expertise in the field, if you would like to share your ideas or give us feedback, uh, we're always happy to hear. And we have very good connections with research groups in Europe and we are using the research uh, uh, successfully, in fact, uh, to increase the quality of the graph because again, it's a public good. So it's uh, not our stuff. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you, Paula. I really appreciate it. All right. It seems uh, that our third presenter uh, was not able to make it. So we're going to our fourth one, which is the... Uh, DOAJ, an open global and trusted infrastructure for open access journals. And forgive me, I, I, you, is it pronounced um, Yvonne? Did I pronounce that right? Um, it's Yvonne. Yvonne, thank you, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, well, I am Yvonne Lujano. I am the community manager of the DOAJ, the directory of open access journals. And I am also uh, an ambassador of the DOAJ in Latin America. I'm gonna talk about this ambassador program uh, later. So for those, in, in case you don't know the DOAJ, uh, the DOAJ is a directory of open access journals. It's the largest uh, directory uh, that lists um, journals, peer reviewed journals from all disciplines and uh, from many parts of the world, uh, more than uh, 135 countries. And um, it's, a, it's very unique in that sense, that it's uh, diverse and that it uh, includes uh, the production of journals in all countries. The, our mission is to raise profile, visibility and impact of all quality OEA journals globally, regardless of discipline, geography or language. So one of the um, core missions and goals of the DOAJ is, is to show this diversity of production and also to debunk myths about the uh, the open access landscape, uh, meaning, um, you know, in the past uh, decade, there was uh, this kind of backlash regarding the, the open access publication saying they are bad quality and if they come from, uh, you know, the global South countries, they are bad quality and so on. So we are, um, our, our mission is to debunk that myth and to show the quality of production of, of science um, from uh, globally. So our criteria of indexing journals are um, a, is becoming or are becoming a, a gold standard for open access publishing. So many initiatives are uh, using our criteria as as a as a list of requirements for funding journals for uh, allocating funds to uh, demonstrate uh, that open access is a it's a it's a reli reliable route to publish uh, their outputs our services and metadata are provided uh, that are, are are completely free of charge of all and by services i mean not only the list of journals itself but also the assessment that we do to the journals and the advice and you know the um all, all the all the resources that we provide to journal editors and publishers to improve their practices of publishing so uh, very briefly, um, a little bit of our history. It was funded in Sweden in 2003 
um, in, a, in, a, in a university and the library of the university, the librarian uh, came up with this idea of having a list of journals <clears throat> that don't uh, charge any fees to the readers and soon became the primary index of open access journals. And today we have more than 20,000 journals listed, listed in the DOAJ. Uh, as it was uh, growing so fast, in 2014, we re revised our criteria and launched these, the, the criteria that we currently use uh, in order to um, set these standards of quality in terms of uh, practice, editorial practices, like, for instance, having this peer review process uh, uh, um, very uh, detailed in their editorial policies and so on, in order to provide the users with trustworthy uh, publications. So in 2016, um, the directory launched a program, the ambassador program, uh, that was established to support and develop open access journals worldwide and to um, have people in different regions um, that help and uh, collaborate with uh, publishers and editors in, uh, in those regions and also to make these uh, bridges and to make the directory uh, really global and not, you know, a, a European organization that, you know, provides uh, things to the world, but this uh, conversation um, was uh, necessary, we thought. So the ambassadors were um, are are still in, in charge of uh, bring a, a, you know collaborating with the communities and also uh, providing feedback to the DOAJ. So uh, from 2020 and onwards, uh, the DOJ has been integrated in open access policies around the world, like the European Union, the you know Plan S, and other policies, and um, and projects about openness are taking the DOJ uh, as the uh, the list and the index where quality journals are uh, included. Um, so these are some of the numbers. Currently, as I said, we have more than 20,000 journals. And the, the number that we like to um, highlight is the 13,000 and more journals that do not charge APCs to the authors. So uh, the DOJ is uh, uh, currently and uh, since the beginning of the project, has strongly supported the diamond journals, meaning these journals that are uh, run by academics and by academic institutions and that usually do not uh, charge anything or do not uh, manage the journals in, in with, with a, a for-profit approach. So uh, other numbers you can see here, uh, the DOAJ emphasizes the multilingualism of science and so we index journals in 80 languages, uh, 134 countries, and more than 10 million uh, articles are uh, provided here in the platform. Um, so the full text is available here. Um, some of the statistics, uh, we have 88,000 in 2022, 8,000 applications. So we receive many applications monthly, uh, but only 20. 25, 26% are accepted. So we have a, a process of quality review that is manually done by our volunteers and the, and the staff. Uh, we have also a, a quality team that, um, you know, do, uh, they, do, they do investigations or like more, uh, more um, detailed reviews and, and assessment of special cases to avoid including in the DOAJ, the so-called predatory or suspect, suspicious or non-reliable journals. Uh, we do that uh, with 20 people in the core staff, more than 100 volunteers. And that's the, the, this is very important to highlight because uh, the, thanks to these people, we can process all these applications and also thanks to our um, ambassadors. So one of the core um, uh, goals of the DOJ is supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this is one of the uh, 
this is the geographic uh, um, spread of journals and, and how we include journals from all regions in the world. Uh, of course, there are some gaps still, for instance, in Africa, but we are trying, uh, and, and, and in this year and the, the, the years to come, we are emphasizing this. And uh, I want to just like share here the numbers of, of the journals, the countries that have more journals in the UAJ. So look at Indonesia. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, but the, the, the government of Indonesia has invested very strongly in the last years in the uh, development of journals. But the UK, Brazil and the United States are the next countries with more journals. So um, um despite having in the UK and the US also many journals that try, that are not open access, uh, there's a strong development of these journals in these countries. And um, same with other parts of the world like uh, Latin America and Brazil. So here's a snapshot of uh, the, 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 the overlapping of the journals in the DOJ and other databases. As you can see, there are many journals that are not included in the other databases, but are included in the DOJ, meaning that we provide a landscape of, uh, or a more comprehens comprehensive landscape of uh, the, or uh, numbers of the uh, open access journals in the landscape. So um, as, as I said, there, there's, these numbers are very uh, important for us because we are supporting uh, the diamond uh, open access journals in many countries. And we have joined uh, several initiatives in different regions to keep um, vis uh, give, uh, providing visibility and supporting the practices that, that these journals have because these journals serve a large community of scholars everywhere. So, um, also, uh, as I said, uh, we support multilingualism and bibliodiversity in the open access uh, landscape. So uh, this uh, is made by, by us thanks to our own diversity. So we have uh, people from 45 countries that speak 35, uh, 36 langu languages and so on. And also we provide the advice to editor, journal editors and publishers in the language that they speak. We have also translated many materials and we are keeping, um, we are improving our, our system. So recently we launched the new version of uh, our blog, our blog that uh, will use technology tr to translate our posts. Um, so this is also a snapshot of the multilingualism of journals. As you can see, Spanish and Portuguese are the second languages more uh, used in, in the journals that we index. So because uh, this is uh, due to the uh, participation of Latin America. So very briefly, I'm going to, because I have two minutes, uh, this is some of the uh, benefits that our uh, that, that journal editors have reported of being indexed in the DOAJ. So increase of traffic to their websites, uh, increase of collaboration with other scholars, and so on. And the last thing I want to say is that I want to show is to is this process of review and decision. So as I said, all the journals. Mm, um, are reviewed manually but by people and also we use uh, tools and technologies but the idea here is to emphasize that we uh, are we make sure that uh, we curate the journals and that we provide a database that is composed by uh, journals that have um, consistent and uh, and uh, reliable practices of uh, quality content and creation so um, this is it. And the last thing I want to say, we support other uh, community projects like the Open Access Journal Toolkit, Jasper, and, other, and Place. So these are tools and, um, and initiatives to support the community, authors, journal editors, and readers to use and uh, take advantage of our database. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, and then our last presentation is Leveraging UNESCO Recommendations to Drive Open Science in Nigeria, and that will be presented by, I am not going to make the same mistake twice. How do you pronounce your name? You're on mute. There you are. Gotcha. Thank you. You floor is all yours. 
Yeah, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening uh, from uh, Nigeria. I'm happy to see Yvonne again. The last time I saw her was 2018 in uh, California. That is at UCSD. Yeah, hi Yvonne, I'm happy to see you. Now, uh, I'll be speaking on the, the, the topic. Just a minute. All right, that says a leverage in the Commission to drive open access, open science in Nigeria. So um, I want to quickly speak about my university, um, the Scholarly Communications Librarian for Afeba Balola University. I think it's a short, uh, short form of it is upward in Nigeria. And I happen to be the first and scholarly communications librarian in the country. Uh, I have so much interest in open science, open access, you know, for years. Now, my university is uh, ranked, you know, by cancer education as uh, the most ranked university in Nigeria for impact for two consecutive years. The university was founded in 2009 by uh, a legal luminary uh, by the name of Trevor Ola, after whose name the university was named. So we operate a collegiate system in the university spanning across uh, possibly every area of knowledge, including law, sciences, medicine, health sciences, and all of that. Uh, now, <clears throat> I think uh, this is the first uh, African uh, content you guys will be seeing uh, in this conference. So it is my pleasure to also welcome you to our continent. And uh, Africa is 20% uh, of the head surface. It is home to 1.3 billion people. Um, it boasts mm -hmm. of 60% uh, of the world's variable land, you know, 30% of the world reserve of minerals, and the youngest population of any country. Uh, yet, you know, despite these staggering figures, you know, there are difficulties. Some of the difficulties we endure in Africa, you know, it produces only 3% of global GDP, and uh, when you bring it to innovation and research, you know, the picture is bleaker. Uh, Africa you know, produces uh, only 2% of what research output. And uh, it accounts for 1.3% of research spending and just 0.1% of all patents, according to the uh, refract human signing. Nigeria happens to be the African most populous nation. And about Nigeria, we have about 230 million people, the sixth largest um, a populated country in the world. You know, Nigeria has about 50 ethnic nationalities and languages, but the lingua franca is uh, English. You know, we have about 260 universities in addition to uh, other numerous research institutions and uh, uh, other higher educational institutes. The currency is Naira. And I'm highlighting that the exchange rate of one unit of dollar is about one thousand four hundred you know, Naira to dollar. And that is it's coming down, you know, it was far, it was approaching 2,000 earlier in the year, and that with the British uh, uh, pound sterling, it's about 1,900, and over 2,000 earlier in the year. You know, uh, Africa, I mean, Nigeria, spent about 8.2% of its budget in education, which is far below the UNESCO recommendation of 25%, and uh, we have about 20 million out of school, you know, people, students, you know, in the country. That makes the video of open science, open access, you know, uh, a more, a very important uh, thing for me as a person, and I think for us as a country, you know, looking at these videos. For instance, to subscribe to a database, you know, let's say ProQuest or, you know, uh, as uh, uh, database, you'd be talking of very, several thousands of dollars, and if you convert that to digital currency, it's a huge sum of one that many institutions will not be able to afford. And in that case, we have, you know, special institutions or universities running on one database or even nothing at times. So open access or open science is critical for us if we can achieve it. Now, I want to speak about the projects, you know, I recently embarked upon uh, through the support of the Open Research Funders Group, you know, and the aim of the project you know, was to create awareness and good advocacy for open science among librarians and researchers in uh, my state of origin, in my state, you know, that is a state, you know, in all the higher educational institutions. And uh, we focused mainly on uh, using the UNESCO recommendation on open science documents, you know, to uh, really drive on this point. Our thinking is that, you know, Nigeria being a member state of UNESCO, you know, 
if something recommended, I mean, if a recommendation is coming from UNESCO, such an multinational organization, perhaps, you know, it would uh, uh, help our government to pay attention to open science. Because before now, there is little or no, there is little effort being paid or attention being paid to open access or open science related activities. Now, we also targeted uh, polytechnics and colleges of education. These are other levels of higher educational institutions in Nigeria. Because in most cases, it, uh, efforts are always concentrated on universities. The other aim of the project was to form uh, the champions in a forum of uh, open science in Egypt. Now, talking about UNESCO recommendation, I think somebody has talked about it in another uh, group. Well, let me quickly you know, do a recap of UNESCO recommendation on open science. It was adopted in, 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 in November 2021 you know, by unanimously by uh, 193 countries you know, present in that term. Uh, uh, UNESCO in a general assembly meeting. And um, the recommendation provides an international framework for open science you know, uh, policy and practice that is given a common uh, definition, shared values, and principles and standards for open science. It also promotes actions to support uh, fair and equitable open science for all. Now, the values you know, of uh, the UNESCO recognition of open science are based quality and integrity mm -hmm. of scientific uh, you know, uh, process and outputs, collective benefit for everyone, irrespective of where you are coming from or where you are based on the health, the equity and fairness to all, you know, diversity and uh, inclusiveness. On the principles uh, side of it, uh, we have transparency. The, the recommendation was, of open science by UNESCO was based on Know, the principle of transparency, scrutiny, you know, of, you know, critic, and the reproducibility of research. The other one is equality of opportunities and the responsibility, respect, and accountability. Of course, collaboration, participation, and inclusion, then flexibility and sustainability. Uh, to wrap up on the UNESCO recommendation, you know, UNESCO did not just make a recommendation alone, but they also, you know, recommend or ask uh, member states, you know, to take certain uh, actions. And one of it is uh, that they should promote a shared understanding of open science, you know, among all uh, stakeholders in their countries and set a diverse path to achieving it, then to develop an enabling policy environment for open science in each of the states, then invest in infrastructure and activities that contribute to open science, and also invest in capacity building training education to support open science like we did with the funded project. Then also to foster a culture of open science and align incentive to support it. And lastly, to promote uh, innovative approaches and also cooperation for open science. And back to our project. What did we do with the project? We have a symposium that brought together librarians from all the higher educational institutions in the state, the city state. Then we also want to follow that on with uh, workshops in each of uh, the institutions. I mean, to, 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 to meet with more people, faculty members, students and staff, you know, on the habit of system for institutions, to take down the message of open science, you know, to each of these institutions. What symposium was uh, attended uh, by people from all over the just in the state, about seven just on the area about, and uh, we have um, speakers uh, from different parts of the world, you know, some there uh, virtually, some in person. You know, we have topics like uh, um, academic libraries and open science. We have uh, uh, understanding open scholars' perspective on the knowledge initiative. That one was very important for us because we happened to bring in the, the, the government of Asia, uh, in person of the Honorable Commissioner for Innovation Science. And digital economy of the state, so as to bring in, you know, uh, to leverage on that to connect the state government, you know, with what we are doing in scholarship, I mean, as academia. So, and uh, it was quite interesting because the state is pushing an agenda for uh, a knowledge zone uh, project, and we were trying to see how we can build open science to that uh, initiative, you know, for another economy. The other thing is we have people speaking about uh, speakers, you know, giving thoughts on the open science, open peer review as a component of open science, uh, and also open science initiatives in Africa. Now, what did we achieve? Or what the 
we're able to get from this uh, uh, interactions. One, you know, we're able to stimulate interest of people in open science, you know, and they'll be taking that back to their respective institution. But some of them were hearing about this series, I uh, think, for the first time, you know, in their life, but, you know, coming around, you know, to discuss these various issues and aspects of open science, and uh, it's brought a lot of enlightenment and, uh, of course, you know, an actionable plans for them, you know, going back to their institutions. The other thing is, we'll be forming the Open Science Champions Forum, the survey was circulated to participants with seen people showing interest in the fact that that champions are of a focus science champions group for the state. Then, uh, second, thirdly, we will be working with the government of the state on an open access infrastructure, you know, for research work coming out of institutions, you know, from Ekiti, not just from, from, from Ekiti, researchers of Ekiti origin who are in different institutions across the world who want to put their work on that uh, open infrastructure like a repository of knowledge for the state, they will be, uh, will, will be developing that, working with them you know, to achieve that goal. The other thing we achieve is we have we are able to understand the challenges, the opportunities, problems, and possible solutions, you know, on various aspects of open science. Because during the symposium, we had breakouts, you know, groups that discussed, you know, these various areas on open science practices, open science science policy, open science infrastructure, open science advocacy and capacity building. Now, uh, the other thing that, that I would say we also, you know, I mean, I'm quoting the Commissioner for uh, uh, Science, Innovation and Digital Economy, you know, this is one of his slides, and he did say, you know, how, what, what, why open science is important, you know, to them as a government, that the knowledge zone is a vision of government leveraging, you know, this State legacy, asset of intellectual capital, and academic excellence to put the new frontier in innovation, collaboration, technological advancement. This project aims to establish a thriving ecosystem of innovative businesses that foster collaboration, innovation, technology, and you know, transfer. Because if it is state in Nigeria happens to be reputable for uh, producing the highest number of scholars, class of professors. So the state wants to really, you know, capitalize on this, you know, to advance on the, uh, to take advantage of the economy and open science is the key part of the contribution in this regard. Now, before the grant came in and we've been doing, you know, some work as an institution, you know, on um, open science, you know, we deployed uh, open science, open, open, I mean, open source and journal management system, the OJS you know, from the PKP, you know, to manage all our institutional journals. I happen to be the one in charge, you know, bringing scholarly publications that we are managing all the journals, and we will put our journals on open access and mode. Okay. Now, um, I will not stop this presentation without mentioning uh, other initiatives, you know, that we are aware of about open science in Nigeria and in Africa. We have the Leaf Sense program, you know, and uh, we have the West African uh, Research Education Network, WACREN. They are also investing so much in open science in the region. And in Nigeria, there is a private, uh, privately owned uh, research education network called APO Connect. They are also involved. I've been at the conference, I've spoken at the conferences you know, over the years. And you know, these are people that are involved in open science uh, in, uh, initiatives in, in Nigeria, West Africa, and North Africa. Now, my future plan, our future plans, you know, of course, we want to push the, the, the Champions for Open Science group, you know, uh, get it established very well. And also, we we'll also be building on the success of this symposium and the project to see how we can take advocacy further into the country, you know, uh, and the developing capacity of people. Then, lastly, we we'll also consider having an institute, you know, West Africa Institute for Open Science. And scholarly communication. And of course, to achieve all of this, you know, funding and partnerships are very, very important. So we invite, you know, as many of you as are willing, able, you know, to join us either in the funding aspect of partnership to help us uh, you know, bring really the message of equality, diversity, that open science, you know, creatures to Nigeria and to Africa and the so thank you. We want to acknowledge the support of uh, the Open Research Congress Group, you know, to the ACID Award, and maybe us to carry out that project. Thank you very much for your attention.
Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. We are right at the time where we need to go ahead and close the session. Uh, I want to pretty much give a round of applause to all of our presenters. Thank you guys so much. Um, and I will see everyone in a future session. So thank you, everyone.